All right, so we're going to continue our discussion of surfaces by moving over to the discrete setting. What is a discrete surface? Well, there are different models, different ways we could think about surfaces in the discrete world. And there are, in particular, two primary models of surfaces that are used and studied a lot in discrete differential geometry. One are simplicial surfaces, so basically triangle meshes, or being a little more precise, simplicial two manifolds. And these are going to be a very natural fit with discrete exterior calculus. We're going to continue to be able to do computation in the way we've been talking about so far. The other, which we won't cover too much in this class, are what are called nets. So you can think of these as uh, mappings of the integer grid into three-dimensional space, or maybe you have little patches of surface that are little pieces of the integer grid. And these are very natural in the study of a variety of problems. Um, they show up immediately in discrete integrable systems. They show up in computational architecture. And there's some very, very beautiful discrete differential geometry uh, that goes on here. So we might have a chance to touch on these later in the class. Um, but if not, something that's definitely worth reading a bit about. Um, the reason we focus on simplicial surfaces is that they are, by and large, more common in applications, in geometry processing, in physical simulation, and again, they are something that fit very naturally with this topic of discrete exterior calculus. So it's going to be very easy to formulate partial differential equations on simplicial surfaces. What is a simplicial surface? We've talked a fair bit about a simplicial complex, but let's just kind of recap here. So loosely speaking, a simplicial surface just means a triangle mesh. It looks like the thing on the right. Okay, but we want to be a little more careful about this definition so that we can connect it in a very precise way to differential geometry. And uh, actually, Later on down the line, we might want to even relax this notion of working with simplicial surfaces. There are other kinds of triangulated surfaces that can be very powerful when it comes to algorithms. As with smooth surfaces, it's very important to put regularity conditions on our surface. Basically, to put some conditions on our surface that says, hey, this isn't going to be some awful degenerate case that we always have to think about, some exception to the rule. We want nice, regular kind of ordinary surfaces. Just like when we talked about parameterized curves, we said, well, we want to make sure that it's regular. The speed never goes to zero. When we talked about smooth surfaces, we talked about immersions, right? That again, there's never this degeneracy in the way the surface gets mapped into space. So when it comes to simplicial surfaces, we have kind of two regularity conditions that are going to make life easier. One is to think about topology. How is the mesh connected up? And our main assumption there will be that the connectivity is manifold. We'll say a little more about that in a second. We've, we've given the general definition, but we'll look at that a little more in detail. And the other is that the geometry um, is given by vertex coordinates that describe a simplicial immersion. So when talking about smooth surfaces, again, being immersed was the thing that made sure we could always compute other quantities like normals, like the Riemannian metric, and so on. We're going to have an analogous condition for simplicial surfaces. Now, one thing to remember is the difference between an abstract simplicial complex and a, let's say, a geometric simplicial complex. Okay? So an abstract simplicial complex was one where we know how things are connected up, but we don't know anything or we don't say anything about what that simplicial complex looks like in space or lengths or areas or angles, just the connectivity. Likewise, an abstract simplicial surface is a manifold abstract simplicial two complex. So it's a simplicial complex made of triangles and edges and vertices with some additional conditions that make it nice. Okay, So the highest degree simplices are triangles, and the, the niceness conditions are sort of two things. One is we could say every edge in the simplicial complex is contained in either two triangles if it's on the interior, or just one triangle if it's on the boundary. 
What's not allowed is for a single edge to be contained in more than two triangles, right? So we have an example on the bottom right here, this edge that's contained in five triangles, and this is what we'd call a non-manifold edge. This is just gonna make it hard to connect the idea of a simplicial surface to a smooth surface if we were to allow that, right? How do we talk about things like tangent spaces at points on this crazy edge? Right? So we want as much as possible our discrete surfaces to look like smooth surfaces. Um, another condition, the second condition, is that every vertex of our abstract simplicial complex or abstract simplicial surface will be connected in just a single cycle of triangles. So if you look at the mesh on the top, around any vertex we can find a single loop of triangles, if you like. Whereas this sort of double cone on the bottom has this point, this, this highlighted point, where sort of two different uh, cycles of triangles meet. Again, this is something that does not look like a manifold surface from the smooth setting. Okay. Um, we also gave another characterization of a manifold simplicial complex when we first introduced the idea. Maybe you remember what that is, right? It basically says that the link of every vertex looks like a sphere. So in two dimensions, the link of a vertex looks like a circle, or it looks like a cycle graph. That condition is equivalent to the one given here except that here we also allow boundary, okay? Um, just in terms of notation, we're typically going to denote our simplicial complex by k, k equals v, e, f. So v are the vertices, e are the edges, f is the set of faces, and k is for complex. I guess maybe this is, this is German, so that's a, a way to remember why do we call it k. Okay, so the really important thing to remember, though, about an abstract simplicial surface is that it has no shape. It really just describes the way the surface is connected up. So that leads to a natural question. What should we do to describe the shape of the surface? Okay. And so for that, just as we had in the smooth setting, we're going to encode the geometry of our simplicial surface by a map F that assigns locations to, well, not all points in the complex initially, but let's just say the vertices, right? So each one of these black dots get us, gets assigned some location in three-dimensional space. And actually that's gonna be enough to tell us what the geometry looks like everywhere else because between any two vertices, we can connect them up by a straight line segment. We can interpolate them to get the edges. And then we can likewise fill in the triangles by interpolating uh, between three vertices of a triangle. And the, the way we're really doing this is we're using um, what are called barycentric coordinates. If you remember, the barycentric coordinates are coordinates that basically get bigger as we approach one of the three vertices. So if I'm at vertex P0, my coordinates are 1, 0, 0. If I'm at vertex P1, there's 0, 1, 0, and so on. We'll talk in just a moment about what we really mean here by these barycentric coordinates, but the high-level idea here is that each simplex in our abstract surface, in our abstract simplicial complex, is now a concrete geometric simplex in Rn. Normally we'll be thinking about R3 because that's where we live and that's where it's easy to draw pictures, but okay, they could be in some other space. In general, just as a piece of terminology, any map from simplices to simplices is called a simplicial map. So this map F is a simplicial map from our abstract simplicial complex into three-dimensional space. Okay, to be more precise about that, to say, you know, did, did what I just said really make sense? We have to answer a basic question, was, which is, well, what actually is the domain of the map F? When we talked about smooth surfaces, we said that the domain of the map F was a region of the plane. But when we're working with an abstract simplicial complex, we don't really have pieces of the plane. We just have this list, right? It's important to remember this, this way of thinking about an abstract simplicial complex is 
it's just a set of sets that's closed under the operation of taking subsets. Right, very abstract. So here, for instance, we might say, okay, uh, the simplicial complex K has some triangles in it, I, J, K, and J, K, L, because it has to be closed under the operation of taking subsets. It also has the edges I, J, J, K, and K, I, and also K, L, and so on, right? So this is just a set of points, uh, really just a set of vertices and collections of vertices. So what are we talking about when we talk about these barycentric coordinates? What is the domain of this map F? Well, the idea, the right way of thinking about this is that barycentric coordinates effectively associate each abstract simplex with a copy of what's called the standard simplex. So let's say for a triangle, for a two simplex, the standard simplex is the set of all points in R3 that have positive coordinates or non-negative coordinates, really, and those coordinates sum to one, right? So we can look at this triangle, either one of these triangles we've drawn here, and notice that the points sum to one, the coordinates of the points sum to one, and it includes these extreme points that are the unit vectors along each axis. We also called this at some point the probability simplex because you can think maybe of these coordinates as probabilities, right? They're non-negative and they sum to one, okay? So when we talk about our simplicial map that takes our complex K into R3, what we're really doing is we're just making a disjoint copy, one of these standard simplexes for each simplex in K, and that becomes the domain of our map. The map is saying, how does that standard simplex get mapped into R3? Now, one thing that's essential here is that points that are shared by two simplices get mapped to the same location in space, right? So if they have these two triangles, IJK and JKL, then whatever the map does along the shared edge JK it has to send those points to the same location. Those two points, those two maps have to agree. We could also say, formally, the domain is the quotient of all of these disjoint triangles with respect to some equivalence relation on their barycentric coordinates. Okay? Okay, so that's the basic description of our surface, of our discrete surface, let's start try, trying to build up some interesting differential or discrete differential properties of this surface. So if we think about our map F in terms of discrete exterior calculus, what we've really said is it's a Rn valued zero form or a discrete Rn valued zero form. It's a assignment of each, uh, assignment to each zero simplex of a point in R3 or a vector in R3, right? So the discrete differential, if we want to kind of take the most basic derivative of this map, that's going to be a value per oriented edge. Right? We said the derivative of a zero form is a one form, a discrete one form is a value per edge, okay? What do these values mean geometrically? If we try to differentiate this map, what do we get? Well, um, let's think about it just in terms of this example here on the right. We have these two abstract triangles that get mapped into space by this map F, okay? And then we can remember, well, what, what really does a discrete one form mean? What does it represent? It represents the integral of a smooth one form over each one simplex, right? So even if we don't know or we never knew what the complete smooth map F was or its smooth differential DF, we can still imagine that it came from such data, okay? And so what we can say is, all right, well then DF along IJ, right? Our discrete one form value for the edge IJ. What does it mean? It means that we must have integrated the smooth differential DF along the edge, 
How do we integrate the differential along the edge? Well, the differential is a one form. It takes as input a tangent vector. In particular, we're going to stick in the unit tangent vector along the edge, along the curve that we're integrating along. So this partial, partial s, right? Just this unit vector in the vertical direction. And that's equivalent to um, pushing forward this unit vector into space, right? The differential takes that unit vector on our abstract domain or really on our standard simplex and pushes it forward into three-dimensional space. And then we integrate that. This is also the same as saying we're just integrating the differential one form df. That's kind of the definition of integration of a one form along a curve. Okay, so at this point we can notice that we're integrating a derivative. And that should remind you of a very important theorem that I'll keep bringing up, which is Stokes' theorem, right? So integrating df along sigma ij is the same as integrating just f itself over the boundary of sigma ij. Sigma ij is an edge, which means its boundary is just the two endpoints. Those two endpoints have opposite orientations relative to the edge itself. And so the integral is just the difference of the values at the two endpoints, fj minus fi. Okay, so in other words, after all that, you know, very, very sophisticated thinking, all we're saying is the discrete differential is just the edge vectors of the mesh. We could have skipped over that. I could have just said, oh, what is the discrete differential? It's the edge vectors on the mesh. Okay, but hopefully now you really understand why, or you really understand what is the differential geometric interpretation of that statement. One really basic thing we can notice at this point is that like any other discrete one form, this quantity, df ij, is anti-symmetric with respect to changing the orientation of the edge. In other words, depending on whether I orient this edge from i to j or j to i, the edge vector is either pointing one way or another. We have to make a choice. Okay, And that choice doesn't matter. We can make it arbitrarily as long as we're consistent about which orientation we use. Okay, so why are we talking about the differential? Why is this useful for understanding discrete surfaces? Well, let's remember in the smooth setting, our notion of regularity was to say that the surface is an immersion and that was some condition on the differential, right? So we study the differential because we want to talk about regularity. In the smooth setting, we said a parameterized surface F is an immersion if its differential is non-degenerate. In other words, if df of x equals zero, if and only if x equals zero. So all this is really saying is no small local piece of the surface gets squashed down to zero in a nasty way. We can have pictures like this. There's nothing here that says globally this map has to have no self-intersections, there's no other sense in which it must be nice and regular, but at least in some little local neighborhood, it must be nice. One way of, of kind of visualizing this also is to say, around any point, I can draw a nice little grid in the plane, and when I map that forward into space, I'll have a nice little grid on a small patch of material in space, okay? And if we have this condition, if we have a smooth immersion, we said that's basically nice enough to define pretty much any other differential quantity we care about, any other local quantity that we care about. Okay, And that's what we want in the discrete case too. We want to somehow translate this condition about being non-degenerate into the discrete setting. Well, the most naive way of, of doing this would be to say, okay, well, non-degenerate means the differential never goes to zero. So that would sort of imply that none of the edge lengths of my triangle mesh should be zero, right? If I start out with this standard simplex and I have this map that takes each edge of the standard simplex into space, well, I should never be allowed to map a non-zero edge to a zero edge. That's very natural, but as we saw with curves, it doesn't quite get us 
where we want to be. It doesn't really faithfully capture some important features of smooth immersions. Um, in particular, something that it fails to do is avoid what are called branch points. So here's an example of a branch point in the smooth setting. I've taken this circular disc and I've sort of twisted it around. I've, I've run around the boundary twice on the outside and twisted up the middle, okay? And this is a map that's perfectly nice. It's a perfectly good immersion everywhere except at the origin where it fails to be an immersion. So we say in the, in the smooth setting, an immersion doesn't allow this kind of behavior. What about in the discrete setting? Okay, well, here's the analogous discrete example. Maybe this picture is actually a little easier to understand. So I have this polygon, this nine-sided polygon, and that's my domain. And I'm mapping it into space by, again, winding the vertices around twice. And okay, at some point, this map has to intersect itself. You see this dashed line where two triangles intersect each other, but that's no problem. Immersions are allowed to self-intersect. What's really a problem is that, well, there is still this kind of nasty branch point behavior at the center vertex, F0, but if we only say that the thing that's disallowed are zero edge lengths, then we'd say this is a perfectly good map, right? If you look at any individual edge here, it got mapped to some nice long edge, okay? So in this sense, we've failed to translate the concept of a discrete immersion from the smooth setting into the discrete setting. The, the real lesson that we learned from this example is that coming up with good discretizations is not just a matter of sort of translating in a straightforward way, turning the crank and doing what is kind of mathematically, I don't know, most straightforward. Sometimes you have to think a little more deeply and say, you know, even though the standard way you might do this in say numerical analysis would lead to one answer, it's not really the answer we want because it doesn't capture the spirit of that original definition. It doesn't capture the reason why we made that original definition. Right? So why did we define an immersion the way we did in the smooth setting? It's so that we can easily talk about things like surface normals at every point of an immersed surface. Well, if we look at this example where we have this vertex wound around twice, you think, boy, that, that's probably going to cause a lot of trouble for defining other quantities, surface normals and so forth. Okay? So we'd like a, we'd like a different approach a different starting point for converting our smooth definition into a discrete one. Okay, so let's try again. And let's try, instead of thinking about this differential or this, this property that the differential is non-degenerate, let's think about a more basic property of smooth immersions, which is just local injectivity. Something that's true about any smooth immersion is that around any point of the domain, I can find a sufficiently small neighborhood around that point so that when I map that neighborhood into space, when I restrict my map to that neighborhood, I actually get an embedding. I get an injective mapping into space. Okay? So that's something that we like about simplicial immersions. I'm sorry, that's something we like about smooth immersions, and it's going to inform our definition of simplicial immersion. So we'll say a discrete immersion now is a locally injective simplicial map. Abstractly, it's saying the same thing. Around any point, I should be able to find a small enough neighborhood that when I restrict my map to that neighborhood, it's an injective map into space. More concretely, what does that look like? Well, here's kind of the basic case, right? I can take my vertex, my abstract vertex neighborhood I map it into R3 in some nice way, and in particular in some way so that it doesn't self-intersect at any point. So this is a valid simplicial immersion for this neighborhood. In fact, this is what every vertex looks like in a simplicial immersion. What's not allowed, first of all, is something like this. Right? Here I have my domain, 
and I map it into space in a way that the two dark vertices on the left get mapped to the single dark vertex on the right. Right? This edge gets collapsed, these faces get collapsed, collapsed. That's certainly not allowed, right? It's still not allowed to have zero length edges. So this definition is stronger than what we said before. Before we said the naive notion would be to just say, oh, a simplicial immersion means no zero length edges, no zero area triangles. And that's still not allowed, but even more. So here's another example where we take this same domain and we map it into R3. And hopefully you can understand what's, what's going on here. So three of these triangles got mapped to one side, three of the triangles got mapped to the other side but they're coincident in space, right? So we have pairs of triangles that are coincident in space. Did any of the lengths go to zero here? No, right? Each length in the image is some nice non-zero length. Did any of the triangle areas go to zero? No. So in that sense, nothing bad happened. Did any of the angles? Are there angles that went to zero? Well, there aren't interior angles that went to zero, but there are dihedral angles that went to zero. Dihedral angles meaning the angle between two adjacent faces in R3. Okay, so maybe you say, ah, well, we should just add to our naive definition of a simplicial immersion that we want no zero lengths and no zero dihedral angles. But in fact, even that's not enough. Even that won't capture this case that we talked about before, this kind of discrete branch point. Okay, so here the lengths are perfectly good, the dihedral angles are perfectly good, the areas are perfectly good, but it's not a locally injective map. Because if we think about restricting the map to a smaller and smaller and smaller neighborhood around the center vertex, it never becomes an injective map, no matter how small we make that neighborhood. Okay? So that's why this is a stronger notion and really the right notion of regularity for discrete surfaces. As long as we satisfy this, everything else is gonna work out fine. All the subsequent expressions we give are gonna be well-defined. We won't be dividing by zero. We won't be doing things that don't make sense. Okay? Um, another important thing to say here is it is a fact that a simplicial map is locally injective if and only if every vertex star is embedded, right? So we don't have to check all sorts of difficult conditions. We just have to say, does every vertex look like the first picture, the yes picture? If I restrict the map to a vertex neighborhood, is it embedded? Okay. So taking a step back, the main takeaway message from this discussion is when it comes to talking about regularity of simplicial surfaces, saying that you have non-zero areas, non-zero lengths, non-zero angles, both interior and dihedral angles, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's really this local injectivity that matters. And that's a good thing to think about as we move on. Do I buy it? Do I buy that I actually need local injectivity or could I go have gotten away with this weaker condition of non-zero quantities? Actually, for some of the quantities we want to define, you probably don't need this local injectivity. But the point is, as with the smooth immersion, it's going to work for all the things we want to define, for all the analogs of smooth differential quantities. Okay? Okay, so let's look at some of those quantities. What are some things that we want to talk about on a surface? The first thing that we talked about on a smooth surface was the normals or the Gauss map. So what is our discrete Gauss map? Okay, so again, for a smooth surface, we said the Gauss map was a continuous assignment of unit vectors, unit normals to the points of the surface. For a discrete immersion, we're going to say the Gauss map is simply the triangle normals, okay, as drawn here. And certainly we'll, we can believe that if we have a discrete immersion, if it's locally injective, then the normals are well-defined, right? And in fact, 
even if it's not locally injective, but we have well-defined triangles, triangles don't get mapped to zero area triangles, okay, it's still well-defined. So this is a pretty robust definition. From the point of view of discrete exterior calculus, we could say that this discrete Gauss map is a dual discrete R3 valued zero form, or put more simply in much more simple terms, it just means we have a vector on every triangle, right? Also, as in the smooth setting, it's really powerful and really important to think about the Gauss map as points on the unit sphere. So I can take each of those normals depicted for the vertex neighborhood at the top, and I could plot each of those unit vectors as a point on the sphere. All of those arrows now rooted at the center of the sphere, right? And I can take this picture even further because I said I could say, well, you know, so far I haven't really said where the normal is at every point on my simplicial surface. I know that it should point in the normal direction of the plane containing each triangle. That's how I came up with these little arrows. But I haven't said, wh where haven't I defined the normals? Right? I haven't defined the normals on the edges of the mesh. Right? Which direction should they point there? I haven't defined the normals at the vertices of the mesh. It's really unclear, you know, at the vertex, there's not like a canonical plane that goes through a vertex of the mesh. Not, not a canonical tangent plane. So what should the normal be? Okay. So this, this picture of the sphere can help to start to get our head around how to think about the Gauss map really for the whole discrete surface. In particular, um, we can say, well, we don't know exactly what the normal should be for an edge. We don't have one unique or one distinct choice of a normal for an edge, but we could say that there is a set of vectors that is orthogonal to that edge, right? Remember that when we started talking about normals, we said normals are those vectors that are orthogonal to all the tangents, okay? So we know at least the normal should be orthogonal to the edge itself. And in fact, there's this family of such vectors that goes between two consecutive points on the sphere. There's this arc along the sphere that corresponds to all the normals we get by starting at one triangle and rotating our normal to the normal of the adjacent triangle, right? So we could actually think of the, the normal at an edge maybe not as a single direction, but as this collection of possible directions. And then we can do the same thing at vertices. We can say, well, I don't really know what exactly the normal at the vertex should be, but I, I have a sense that it, it really should be somewhere between the normals of all the faces, right? So that would be the whole shaded polygon in the middle. We can be more precise about this, and we'll talk this, about this a little more when we discuss uh, the Steiner formula. But that's a good intuitive way of thinking about what is the normal at points on a triangle mesh on a discrete surface. Now, quite often you do eventually have to pick, you do have to nail down what is my specific normal that I want to work with. I'm doing some calculation, some computation, I have to pick a vertex normal. So how do I do that? The Gauss map, this discrete Gauss map, doesn't give it to us. It doesn't give us one canonical choice. So what do we do? Well, there's lots of possible ad hoc definitions. People, people pull out all sorts of things. You know, they say, oh, maybe I'll just take the average of all the normals of all the triangles that touch that vertex. Or maybe I'll come up with some arbitrary um, way of, of weighting these normals that sounds good to me. Well, you have to be careful. And and there, there are kind of good ways and bad ways to define vertex normals. Generally, the principle is to say, can I come up with a vertex normal that guarantees that at least some behavior is good, right? Not just a completely random definition. And I can also watch out for definitions that have obviously bad behavior. So here's a really clear example. If I said, oh, well, I'm just gonna define my normal as the average of the normals of all triangles that touch the vertex, 
then you can get completely different results by just changing the way the surface is tessellated, right? So here we have two different possible tessellations of the same geometry. We have this little kind of circular disc that's been bent around, along its middle. And depending on whether we put more triangles on the right side or more triangles on the left side, the arithmetic mean, the average of these face normals is going to point in completely different directions. It's really not capturing the geometry of the surface. So the approach that we'll advocate in this class being discrete differential geometry is to start in the smooth setting and try to apply some kind of principled discretization. Go from the smooth to the discrete and hopefully some property, some natural property will be satisfied at all times. So for this, we can return to what we discussed last time, the vector area. So remember that the smooth vector area is this two form NDA. And if we integrate NDA, if we get the total vector area over a patch, we can write that in terms of differential forms as, well, okay, first we figure out that we can write uh, one half, uh, sorry, we can write two NDA as DF wedge DF. So instead of integrating NDA over the patch, we can integrate DF wedge DF or half DF wedge DF over the patch. And then we can apply Stokes theorem to turn that into one half the integral over the boundary of F cross DF. So we got this really interesting property of the vector area, which is that it depends only on the shape of the boundary of the patch and not at all on the shape of the interior. We don't have to even know what the shape of the interior is to define this quantity, okay? So one idea, one pretty reasonable idea for defining a vertex normal is to integrate NDA over a region of the mesh where we actually know what the normal is, right? So we could, for instance, if we want to know a vertex normal at this point P, at this vertex P, we could consider the dual cell, this blue region, and we could integrate NDA over this dual cell to get some definition for a vertex normal. Why is that a meaningful thing to do? Well, for all but a vanishingly small set of points in this blue region, we know exactly what the normal looks like. It just looks like the normal of the triangles, okay? So we can carry out this integral without having to think about what are these undefined normals. In particular, let's say we wanted to integrate over this patch, and if we think of this blue region as the barycentric dual cell, then the integral over the, the blue region is going to be just one-third the integral over the entire vertex star. That's the same as integrating one-sixth of f cross df over the boundary, according to our formula at the top. Okay, and then we can say, well, okay, what does it mean to integrate over the boundary of this vertex star? It really means to just sum up over all the edges in the boundary, in this case, all six edges of this hexagon, to sum up the integral over each edge. So we're going to integrate now along each edge, f cross df. Okay, and remember that f is the vertex positions and df is essentially the edge vectors, right? So we can very easily turn this integral into just a final sum, one-sixth sum over edges in the boundary of half fi plus fj cross fj minus fi. So what did I do there? How did I get this expression? Okay, so think about just integrating over a single edge ij, just this edge on the far right. Along this edge, df is constant. It's just a vector or vector field pointing along the edge, okay? And f is linear. It's a function that linearly interpolates between the position at i and the position at j. So a good thing to know about integrating linear functions is that I can get the integral of a linear function by evaluating it at the midpoint of the domain and multiplying by the size of the domain. In this case, multiplying by the edge length. 
And by the time I've worked that out, by the time I've, I've canceled out that factor of edge length, I get exactly the expression shown here. Fi plus Fj over two cross Fj minus Fi. Now with just a little more work, basically by distributing the cross product over the difference and doing a little simplification by noticing this is a this is kind of a cyclic sum, I can actually write that as a much simpler expression that says, how do I get the area vector for this vertex star? I just sum over all the edges, the cross product of the two endpoints. Really quite simple uh, formula. Again, also looks a little mysterious because you'd think, oh, well, if I translate the surface, if I, if I add C, some constant C to all the vertex positions, shouldn't this quantity change? Well, you can go back and convince yourself, actually, that's not true again because of this fact that you have this cyclic sum. And, you know, in some sense, of course, it can't be true because we started out by integrating the normals over this patch. The normals don't change if I translate the surface around. Okay? So that's our discrete vector area. And the most important thing uh, to notice now is to say, well, is it a good definition of a vertex normal? One thing that I find a little bit funny about it is the final expression doesn't depend at all on the location of the middle vertex, the vertex P. I mean, that was kind of the whole setup with the, the vector area, that it, it depends only on the shape of the boundary and nothing about the shape of the interior. Is that a reasonable way to define a vertex normal in a triangle mesh to say, even if I put the center vertex in some crazy location, the vertex normal doesn't change? Maybe it is, maybe it's not but it is a fairly principled way to approach the definition. There are, however, other very natural definitions. So one that is at least very intuitively attractive is to say, why don't I do an area weighted vertex normal? So I sum up all the normals of all the triangles weighted by the triangle areas, A, I, J, K. Um, at first, this sounds like I'm just doing something arbitrary. I'm just doing it because it sounds nice. Actually, when we talk about discrete curvatures, you'll discover that this area-weighted vertex normal corresponds exactly to the volume variation. So we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the curvature of curves. Right? I can think about curvature in terms of making the curve longer and shorter, and that has something to do with the speed at which you go in the normal direction and so forth. Well, in the smooth setting, if I look for the motion of a surface that increases the volume as quickly as possible, that's just equal to the unit normal direction. So likewise, in the smooth setting, if I consider the motion of that center vertex that increases the volume enclosed by the mesh as quickly as possible, that's actually going to turn out to be the area weighted vertex normal. Okay, so at least one property from the smooth setting is exactly preserved if we use this definition. Another possibility is to use the angle-weighted vertex normal, meaning we just sum up the triangle normals times the interior angles at the corner that touches the vertex of interest. Right? So sum over all incident triangles IJK, of theta sub i j k, that's the angle at vertex i of triangle i j k, times the normal n i j k of that triangle. Why is this a natural definition? Why is this a good definition? Well, for one thing, it's pretty clear, this is gonna give us the same result independent of how we triangulate that neighborhood. If we split triangles into two, it's not gonna change at all the resulting vector. And this is a very important perspective in discrete differential geometry that we'll talk about later on, that the geometry of a polyhedral surface really has very little to do with how it's triangulated. Okay, so there are lots of different ways we can define the discrete vertex normal. This may start to remind you of this discussion we had on the first day of class where we said there are lots of different ways to discretize the curvature of a curve in the plane. 
not one of them is the right one and the rest are the wrong ones, but each one has particular properties that we might care about depending on what kinds of algorithms we're thinking about or what kinds of theorems we're trying to prove, right? The point here I would say is any, from a practical point of view, please just use anything but the uniformly weighted average, right? You have so many better options. Please use at least one of them. Okay. So now that we have a pretty good handle on what a discrete surface looks like and some of its basic differential properties, let's talk a little bit about what happens with discrete exterior calculus on curved surfaces, right? So in the smooth setting, we first defined exterior calculus in Euclidean RN in this flat space. And then we talked about how to augment it to work on curved surfaces. And the key observation there was, well, we don't have to change everything about exterior calculus. We don't have to change the exterior derivative. We don't have to change the wedge product. We just have to sort of update our Hodge star to account for the fact that the surface has some curvature. And the important idea there is that the Hodge star really captures all the geometric information about the surface. It tells us everything we want to know about length and angle and area and so forth. In the simplicial case, we did the same thing. We started out by talking about discrete exterior calculus for simplicial complexes in Rn. And it's gonna turn out actually that for simplicial surfaces in R3, meaning for curved simplicial surfaces, um, life is gonna be even easier than it was in the smooth setting. And the, the reason basically is each simplex, each edge and face and so forth is already flat. So the things we did to define the Hodge star for uh, flat meshes is gonna work just as well for our curved meshes. We basically have to make no change to our discrete Hodge star. Okay, so let's, let's see how this works. So just remember first that on a simplicial surface, we discretize the Hodge star and represented it as a diagonal matrix that stores primal dual volume ratios. So for instance, to discretize the Hodge star on discrete one forms, we said, let's take the dual edge length, L star IJ, this light blue edge, divided by the length of this dark blue edge, LIJ. And you can work that out in, in a variety of ways. At the end, you can sum up that ratio as a very nice formula, the cotan formula, which says that the ratio is equal to one half the cotangent of alpha IJ plus cotangent of beta IJ, where alpha IJ and beta IJ are the two angles opposite the dark blue edge, okay? So that's the value that we put in the diagonal of the Hodge star. That's how we converted a circulation along the primal edges to a flux through the corresponding dual edges. And then we had a similar idea for discrete differential forms of other degrees. So for zero forms, we said, okay, what does the Hodge star do? It takes us from a k form to an n minus k form, where n is the dimension of the space. So for zero forms, it should take us from a zero form to a two form when we're on a surface, which means we're gonna go from a quantity stored at zero simplices, vertices of the primal complex, to two cells of the dual complex, so this light blue cell here. How do we do that? Well, we just multiply by the area of the dual cell and divide by the volume of the primal cell, the volume of a vertex. Well, the volume of a vertex is just one by convention, right? What is the volume of a zero dimensional set? So the zero form Hodge star is just the area of this light blue polygon. Again, we can write out an expression for this polygon just in terms of edge lengths, L, and interior angles, alpha, of the triangle mesh, okay? And finally, for two forms, we said that to go from a two form, a value stored on every primal triangle, to a dual zero form, a value stored on every dual vertex, we just do the opposite. We multiply by the volume of the dual cell, which is one. The volume of a point, again, is one. 
divided by the area of the primal triangle, AIJK. And here I've just shown that you can write out this area, again, purely in terms of the edge lengths of the triangle mesh. This is a standard formula called Heron's formula for the triangle area. Okay, so that's what we did for triangle meshes in two-dimensional Euclidean space. What happens now if our mesh is no longer flat? Right, now we want to talk about curved surfaces. Well, the good news is really nothing changes. We can still just apply the same formulas that we saw in the last slide, which depend only on the lengths of the edges and the interior angles of the triangles. So for instance, for the one form Hodge star, we're going to take a length ratio, okay? But now we just have to be careful. This is a length ratio, not of lengths in three-dimensional space. So if I have these two bent triangles at the top, my dual length is not the length along the straight segment between those two white vertices in three-dimensional space. Instead, it's the length of the straight path between those vertices along the surface or along those two triangles. Now, at first that might sound complicated. Oh, how do I compute this straight path on this, these bent triangles? The right mindset to get yourself in is to say, well, look, I can also just take those two triangles and I can flatten them out into the plane by just, just unfolding the hinge, right? Without any kind of stretching or distortion of lengths and angles, I can just flatten that out into the plane. Well, that's nice because now I know my expression for the ratio of the primal and dual edge length is the same as before, right? I can just use the cotan formula. Well, the cotan formula only involved interior angles of the triangles. And those I can read off directly from my bent pair of triangles. I don't need to do any additional work. So it's super nice. I don't have to change anything about my discrete Hodge star to use it on a triangulated surface. For zero and two form Hodge star, it's a similar picture, right? In the planar case, we had a ratio of areas. On my curved mesh, I can still work out those areas. I just do it one triangle at a time and sum them up. The fact that it's curved really doesn't cause me any trouble. Okay? And it makes sense in terms of the smooth picture that things should work out this way. In the smooth setting, these Hodge star operators are purely intrinsic operators. They don't depend at all about on how a surface is sitting in space. So it really should be true that we can bend and deform and the surface in ways that don't distort the geometry, that don't distort the Riemannian metric, and get the same Hodge star. Okay? And the key takeaway again is life is good. The 2D formulas also work just fine for curved simplicial surfaces. All right. From here... This whole story about discrete exterior calculus continues to be just as nice as before. So why is it nice to have these basic discrete differential operators, the exterior derivative, the Hodge star, and so on? Well, because once we have these basic components, we can assemble them in various ways to get more interesting operators, divergence and curl, and for instance, the Laplacian. So now in the smooth setting, the ordinary 2D Laplacian when we write down the analogous expression for a smooth surface becomes what's called the Laplace Beltrami operator, which we denote by this capital delta. Delta phi can be expressed as star d star phi. Okay, what does this operator mean and why is it useful? We'll talk a lot about that. We're gonna have a whole unit talking about the Laplacian, the Laplace Beltrami operator, the discrete Laplacian and so forth. But for now, the point is to say, all of the hard work has been done on discretization. As long as we've built up D and star in the 2D case, we actually know how to build up D and star on curved triangulated surfaces. And then we can go ahead and build these operators with no trouble, okay? In the discrete case, using these expressions 
for the discrete Hodge star, we can write the discrete Laplace Beltrami operator in terms of the famous Cotan formula. So basically what you see happens is that Hodge star on one forms pops up here. Now one thing I've made a slight change to here is I've omitted the final Hodge star, the first star in star D star D. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about the Laplace and why when you're solving equations, it's usually more natural to just use this Cotan formula. Okay, but that's for another lecture. Okay, so finally, let's, let's talk about a kind of fundamental question about discrete surfaces and what information is required to encode a discrete surface. So what we've seen is that in a variety of situations, geometry can be recovered from differential quantities. The most basic example, not really geometry, but just from your calculus class, is that ordinary functions, you know, real functions on the real line, can be recovered from their derivative up to a constant shift. That was the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And so that's our most basic example of, of talking about differential representations, using derivatives to encode or describe a piece of data. We also saw the fundamental theorem of plane curves, kind of a generalization of this fundamental theorem of calculus, which says a curve in the plane can be recovered by its or from its curvature. Right? Or more precisely, an arc length parameterized plane curve can be recovered from its curvature up to a rigid motion. Then we had a similar theorem for space curves. A curve in three dimensional space can be recovered from its curvature and torsion up to a rigid motion. There are also theorems like this for smooth surfaces, which we'll talk about. We need to talk about curvature a little bit more to really say how to, how to formulate that. But basically, a smooth surface can be recovered from what's called its first and second fundamental form. We'll talk in a moment about how other special classes of surfaces can be recovered from more specialized differential data. So convex surfaces can be recovered from the Riemannian metric, and so on and so on. This is a beautiful question from differential geometry. What information is sufficient to describe a piece of geometry? This is also closely connected to the question of rigidity. If I give you a certain shape, can I deform it without changing certain data about that shape? Okay. What we want to know for right now is, well, what data is sufficient to describe a discrete surface? to describe a simplicial surface? This is a really nice question that we can get our, we, we can really get our hands on. So I'm gonna just start out with one example. There are lots of different kinds of data that we could try to use to recover a discrete surface, but here's just one particularly interesting example. And this is the question of recovering the shape of a surface from its normals, okay? So let's say we're only given the Gauss map. We only know for each triangle what is its unit vector? From that data alone, can we recover the immersion of the surface? In other words, can we recover the vertex positions? And to be a little more specific here, what I'm thinking about is a closed simplicial surface, something that has no boundary, right? And note also that it's immersed. So no, no degeneracy, no you know, edges going to zero, no branch points, nothing like that, okay? So, so think about that for just a second. If I just hand you the connectivity of a mesh, the abstract simplicial complex, and the unit vector that's the normal for each triangle, but nothing else, I don't give you the vertex positions, I don't give you any angles or lengths, can you tell me what is the shape of the mesh? And it's really kind of unfair to give you only about 10 seconds to think about that, that problem. It's a, it's a pretty tricky question. Um, it turns out the answer to this question is, surprisingly enough, yes. If I know only the normals, I can still determine the vertex positions. How do I do that? Well, here's my basic recipe. So first what I'm gonna do is, for every edge of the mesh, I have two triangles 
next to it, right? I said it's a manifold triangle mesh. So I'm going to take the cross product of the two normals that are adjacent to each edge. Since each of these two triangles is uh, contains that edge, the cross product of those two normals is going to be parallel to the edge. It doesn't tell me the length of the edge, but it does give me a vector that's parallel to the edge. So I could, if I want, normalize it. I can always get a unit vector along every edge in the mesh, right? So from normals, I can already go to edge directions. Once I have the edge directions, I can actually recover the angles at the corners of every single triangle by just taking the dot products of those unit edge vectors, right? And then, since I know the three angles of a triangle, if I know the three angles of a triangle, that determines the shape of the triangle up to, well, scale and in three dimensions, some kind of rotation, right? But the normal already determines for me the plane for each triangle. So I started out with the normals. That was the data I was given. So I know the plane of every triangle and I know the shape of every triangle in every plane up to some uniform scale. Okay, so I've gotten pretty far here. How do I, how do I bring this home? How do I finally construct my, my surface? Well, I can think about this kind of algorithmically. I just build the first triangle. So I pick some initial triangle. I find the three angles at the corners and I know what plane it's in and I'll just pick the scale arbitrarily. I don't know, I'll pick it so that the first triangle has unit area, okay? I'm gonna plop it down and I'm just gonna fix that in three-dimensional space. It's gonna stay there for the rest of time. Now I go over to one of the neighboring triangles and I do the same thing, but this time I build the triangle so that it has the same scale as my first triangle. The edge that it shares with that first triangle has to match up. So I give that new triangle the same scale as the first triangle. I also know where in space to put it. I need to put it in a place so that the endpoints of the edge meet. And I know what plane it sits in. I have its normal, right? So I could build triangle one and then triangle two. And then I just keep going with this process until I've recovered the whole surface. And as long as those normals really did come from some initial surface, I will recover the shape of that surface perfectly. As in all my other examples in the past, there's some constant of integration. There's some data that's not completely determined by the normals. What is it in this case? What am I missing? So this time, as I've already said, I have to pick a scale, right? I only know the shape up to some global scale. Okay, that's fine. I still know what it looks like. And I've also chosen a translation arbitrarily. Otherwise, the surface is determined. Okay, the next question is, am I lying to you? Does this procedure always work? Is there something wrong here or is this gonna work no matter what surface these normals came from? I'll let you think about that question. The fact though is that it does clearly work in some cases, if not all cases. And so in relation to the smooth setting, we can ask, well, is that what we would have expected? Is it strange that we can recover a discrete surface from its Gauss map? Is that something that we could have done in the smooth setting? Is that something that everybody already acknowledges? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a description of smooth surfaces. Well, let's consider first, just to get our heads around this, let's consider a simpler case. Let's consider a Gauss map on a curve. So let's say I just know for a curve in the plane, I just know the unit normals. Okay, so let's say for this circle, I don't know that it's a circle. I only know that its unit normals are cosine s, sine s. Okay? And there's a problem, which is that unless we also know that the curve is arc length parameterized, unless we also know the parameterization of the curve, then actually this same n of s is the Gauss map of any convex curve in the plane. 
And so if we go faster and slower along the curve, we can recover these different funny shapes. Okay. Same story for any convex discrete curve, same story for any convex smooth surface. Just knowing the normals is not enough to determine the surface. Okay, so it's a little bit of a mystery. Why in the discrete setting is it enough to just know the normals? I didn't really give any information about parameterization of the surface, did I? I had the mesh connectivity and I had the normals. And to make this even stranger, I just want to point out that this isn't true for all discrete surfaces. If I had a surface that wasn't a simplicial complex, it wasn't made of triangles, but let's say it was made of quadrilaterals instead. Well, then the normals definitely don't determine the geometry. Here's an example where in all four of these little pictures, I have exactly the same normals, the same six normals, but I have very different shapes and sizes for all the faces. So something very, it seems something very magical happened in the case where all my faces are triangles. Okay, so I'm going to let you sit with that mystery. This is a good thing to think about offline. Okay. In general, we can ask this question, what data is sufficient to describe a surface, right? We've seen in some cases, the data that we have is ambiguous. It doesn't nail down exactly what the shape of the surface is. And this is a question that people have been studying in smooth differential geometry for many, many years. Um, it's something that people recently have started to think about more for discrete surfaces. Why, you know, why is it an interesting think of, thing to think about in the discrete case? Well, because of computation, because of algorithms, because of uh, geometry processing, right? You want to take your data, you want to turn it into some form that's convenient to manipulate or where you can analyze it and understand it clearly or you know whatever it is and then still be able to recover the original shape from that auxiliary data right we we talked about for instance the fact that it's really nice to think about a curve or a space curve in terms of its curvature or its curvature and torsion because if i now want to compare two curves i've already factored out the rigid motion i don't need to do global 3D registration of these two curves. Likewise, for surface processing, right? If I work with these differential representations, I've factored out a lot of information that I may not care about if I'm just trying to think about the shape or understand what the shape is, okay? So it's good to go back into differential geometry and, and say, what have people understood about um, how to characterize smooth surfaces? One nice theorem that's easy to talk about is this one by Convossen that says that a smooth convex surface is uniquely determined up to rigid motions by its Ramanian metric. Right? We've talked about this Ramanian metric of a surface. If the surface is convex, it's kind of positively curved everywhere, then the Ramanian metric is enough to describe the entire surface. That's kind of interesting. That's kind of fascinating. What did the Ramanian metric tell us? It told us how to take inner products of tangent vectors. Why is knowing how to take inner products of tangent vectors enough to describe the whole shape of the surface? Well, if you think about it for a little while, you say, oh, well, you know, knowing how to take inner products of tangent vectors is enough to be able to talk about lengths of vectors. If I can talk about lengths of vectors, maybe you can start thinking about things like shortest paths between points. So now I have a more global view of distances between points. I can build up more and more information from this Ramanian metric. And so the game is to say, well, can I build up so much information about the geometry that I actually know it completely? And what this theorem is saying is, yeah, you, you can know that if it's convex, or at least there's a guarantee that if it's convex, then you know the geometry uniquely. Okay, so an analogous uh, theorem in the discrete setting, still still quite old, is is people like Alexandrov and Connolly and Pogorlev and others talking about convex polyhedra rather than convex smooth surfaces. So there's a theorem or several different versions of theorems that say a convex polyhedron is uniquely determined by its edge lengths. If I just know the edge lengths, I can recover 
the geometry in space. Okay, beautiful. So the metric sounds really important. Unfortunately, it's not always true in the non-convex case. In the non-convex case, if I know the Ramanian metric or I know the edge lengths, that's not always enough to determine the geometry. And one kind of class of examples you can think about here is, let's say that I have a uh, piece of geometry that has a flat side, like a cube, and then I add just a little bump to that flat piece. So I add a bump going out or a bump going in. Well, then I can kind of pop that bump back and forth in and out without changing anything about lengths, without changing anything about inner products. So unfortunately, these really nice theorems kind of stop at convex shapes. Still, from a practical point of view, um, you might like to know, can I still do a good job of recovering general non-convex shapes from their metrics? So this is a, um, this is a, a empirical experiment I did. I drew a triangulation on a banana, and I took a ruler, and I measured very carefully the length of each little edge of that banana, and you know, hook them up into a mesh with the right connectivity. And by running some various, uh, you know, geometric algorithms, I was able in this case to recover the shape of this original banana pretty well, right? Um, does that mean it's always possible? Can you come up with algorithms that are guaranteed to always produce the right shape, right? So this is a really nice kind of contemporary question people are looking at in discrete differential geometry. Um, one recent algorithm that's just very nice, you can go read about it, is this one called shape from metric, which does a very good job of recovering the mesh from, from lengths. It falls short of giving a you know hard, uh, rigorous guarantee that it will always give you the exact shape, but has some beautiful, beautiful ideas in it about discrete surfaces, discrete immersions, what are called spin structures, and so forth, um, that really get at the heart of this problem. So if you're interested in knowing more about this reconstruction problem, um, I'd definitely go check out this paper. All right, so that's it. I will talk to you next time.